the center, defined as a focal point around which any object revolves. We, however, define the center to mean much more. It's where knowledge and ideas form a nucleus, where dreams intersect with possibility, a starting point from which your life can go anywhere. This is how we at Columbia Business School define the center, the very center of business. Here, you'll find the center of opportunity, where world-class academics open doors to the world's most dynamic place of business, New York City. Come, learn at the center of knowledge, where top academic minds do leading edge research on the latest business trends and innovations. Be at the center of access, where today's titans of industry spend everyday face time with students and faculty. Discover the center of convergence, where finance, fashion, media, healthcare, high tech, and all industries intersect. Join the center of community, where high achievers the world over share an open exchange of ideas and perspectives. Dream at the center of entrepreneurship, where an Ivy League business degree gives you entree to the world's fastest growing startup environment. And reach the center of global impact, where a network of over 40,000 alumni are creating real change across the planet. The very center of business, where all potential converges, where chances for success revolve all around, a place you just won't find anywhere else. Come, find yourself here, at the very center of business, Columbia Business School. Live streaming from Columbia Business School in New York City. My name is Gordon Zhang, and welcome to the fourth session of Columbia China Business Conference. As a defining leading force, China's technology sector is at a historical juncture of enormous potential and intense competition. What are the bottlenecks, risks, and exciting trends facing the Chinese technology companies? Joining us today are Professor Ze Xiangli, Dr. Edward Su Ningtian, Dr. Howard Yang, Professor Ya Qing Zhang, and Mr. Alex Zhou. Professor Ze Xiangli is a professor at the Department of Electronic and Computer Engineering at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Professor Li also founded several successful technology companies, including DJI, a world dominant player in commercial and consumer drones. Dr. Edward Su Ningtian is the co-founder and chairman of Asia Info, the first internet technology provider in China. He is also the founder of China Broadband Capital, a TMT-focused private equity fund. It is now focusing on the investments in 5G ecosystem. Dr. Howard Yang is a co-founder, chairman, and CEO of AI Science at Tsinghua University. He previously served as the president of Baidu, and was a key leader at Microsoft for over 16 years. Mr. Alex Zhou is the partner at Qiming Venture Partners and focuses on investments in frontier technology. Mr. Zhou is also an MBA, an MBA alumnus of Columbia Business School. With this panel, we almost have enough of a spectrum of innovators to change the world. And now let's see what these leaders have to say about the future of technology. 
This panel will be moderated by Mr. Alex Zhou and it will be conducted in Chinese. Now, let's welcome Alex. Okay, thank you, my alumni Gordon, for your introduction. So today it is my great honor to chat with four technological leaders here in China. And 10 years ago, 2011, at the time, I was the co-chairman of this CBS China Business Forum. At that time, we would never have expected to invite such a big number of leaders from each segment to participate in such a forum. So I think today's theme is perfect for the panelists of today. It's about the technological advancement. So just now, uh, the MC has introduced the panelists to us, their bio respectively, but I think our audience all know these big names very well. So I have a warm up question first. The question is about your personal story. We know a lot of uh, online audience used to study uh, or are right now studying in America or work in America. So the four of you, why did you decide to come back to China after studying and working in America for so many years? And why did you decide to develop your business or yourself uh, in China? So what is, what's the logic behind that? So two or three minutes for each person. So tell us the stories beyond the bio introduction. So right in front of me, I see Howard Young. Maybe we can start from you. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Hi, everyone. I am Howard Young. I am the chairman and CEO of Montage Technology. Well, among the panelists, I think I am one of the early uh, returnees. At that time, it was 1994. At that time, we don't even have the so-called uh, returned Chinese from overseas. At that time, the concept was very new. I went to America for study, and then I worked in Silicon Valley for five years. And I saw, well, back then in China, there was no semiconductor companies that are really, or that were really successful. I, but we see in Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, including Singapore, their business was very good at that time. So I had firm confidence that we had hope in China. So I gave up my job in America and came back to China to start my own business. But you know, in the very early days, the well, everything was not very ready. So I worked in Shanghai Billy for two years and I taught in Fudan University at the same time during nighttime. So uh, were the engineers. So when the time was ready, I started to create my own company. And the first one after two years, you know, at that time, there was not really any capital market for you to go IPO or whatsoever. So there was an opportunity to be merged with a public American company. So Basically, I sold my company. And three years after that, I left that company and started my current company because I never gave up hope. I wanted to create a company that can go IPO independently. So I started Montage Technology with some friends with the same ideas. So the original plan was to be listed in NASDAQ, but we exited and got listed in BP. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Howard. And the second panelist is Professor Ya Qing. So now it's your turn. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Alex. And also, I'd like to say thank you for CBS to organize such a forum. 
and for inviting me. I came back in China at the end of 1998, and in 1986, I went to the US for studying and worked there for almost 10 years. During this 10 years, I always wanted to come back, but yet to find the right opportunity and platform. But in the end of 1998, Microsoft decided to establish an institute in China, a research institute. So Professor Li Kaifu invited me to come back to establish such a research institute. So that was from zero to one to start up our own business to create a basic computer science research institute. So I am very happy to see after two decades, the Institute has made great achievements in, in terms of uh, basic study and research. Also, it has fostered a lot of talents for China and the rest of the world. And if you have a look at the renowned universities and the big companies, CEOs, or the entrepreneurs of the startups, a lot of them graduated or had training from us. And then I was chairman for Baidu for five years. New technology, new business, like quantum computing, chips, intelligent cloud, autonomous driving, AI, etc. I always love doing new things better from zero to one. So when I came back and the Microsoft Research Institute provided such an opportunity. And some of our alumni, they have the great logic, you know, they a benchmark against some criteria, for example, 20 standards in deciding whether or not to come back to China. But I decided to come back because there was something that is very significant. And I have a great devotion for China. So I didn't think too much at the time. Exactly. From the perspective of investment, when we invest in graphics or AI, we feel if the founding team just like the Microsoft Research Institute you established at that time, if they have some connection with your institute, I will have great confidence in the founding team. So exactly, you are like the, a military school for the whole industry. And next, Professor Edward Tian, tell us your story. Actually, Ya Qing is a very good friend of mine. And I know more personal stories about him, which encouraged him to come back to China. And for me, when I studied my master's degree in 1987 in the Academy of Science, I received a letter from my family telling me that my grandpa was seriously ill. I remember at that time, you know, my grandpa was in Weifang. And in order to make a telephone call, I spent seven hours waiting in the line, but the call didn't make it through. So eventually I purchased a train ticket to go back to Weifang. And when I went to America at that time, the internet was called BitNet in 1988. And it's, it was free of charge. And it could reach every corner of the world. And I wondered, how could I bring such a thing to China? And then I met Ding Jian. And Ding Jian is from the internet industry. And at that time, our concept was to bring internet to your home. So this kind of a sensation encourage me doing my job. And eventually, you know, the building, the telephone or telecom building that I tried to make the call was acquired by us. So it was very interesting. Maybe it was all about fate. And, you know, 
I used to work for a telephone company for so many years, so that's my experience. Exactly. Steve Jobs talked about dot connected. You know, there's a mysterious connection between everything. Yes, especially when you get older and older, you tend to believe in the mysterious stuff. For example, there is a mysterious cosmos out there. If you ask me why I started my own business, it might be the seven hours when I waited in that telecom building. And for quantum computing theory, indicates that maybe among some parallel cosmos or universes, your fate was connected. Exactly, that's exa exactly like my experience with the CBS. Okay, now let's give the floor to Professor Dexiang. For Stanford computer science professors, you and these professors are the most successful professors in the world, not to mention your uh, academic research, but also about the big number of entrepreneurs you have trained. Thank you for the invitation to participate in the CBS event. In 1990 to 1992, in New York University, I taught in New York University during that time, and I often went to Columbia University to you know play basketball with students and teachers from Columbia, and then I took the metro to go back to NYU. So I did have some connection with Columbia. I went to America for university education in 1979 in College Mellon and then to Berkeley for my PhD degree, then to MIT for less than one year. And then in NYU, I taught for three years. At that time, I always wanted to come back to establish a university. At that time in Berkeley, we had Chinese students in 1986 and 87. We were wondering whether it was possible to go back to China and start a new university. But at that time, the background of environment was not ready. But then we heard that Hong Kong University of Science and Technology was founded. And occasionally, I heard that some mainland students, also including students from Taiwan and from other countries who stayed in America for many years, and then they came to a location that was the closest to mainland China and established a university. So after playing basketball, and in 1992, I came back to the Science and Technology University. In the very early days, you know, I gave, I gave lecturers, I did research, and in 98 and 99, Chen Zhen was exploring how to transform industries, but they had no universities, they had no institutes. So by chance, students and teachers from the University of Science and Technology go to Shenzhen to help with the transformation. And in Shenzhen, there were a lot of people from Hunan province, and there were plenty of uh, Hunan restaurants, very tasty. So I started my entrepreneurship in Shenzhen. So that was a very simple description of my early days. Thank you very much for your sharing. I just want to add, and I think 
including Alex, we've had very similar experiences. We studied in the US and then we pursued further education in the U or in China and then in the US. And uh, we've had very good um, luck. For these years, there are two mega trends for us. First one is innovation in information and technology from PC to mobile to internet and all the way to artificial intelligence. And the second mega trend is uh, the rise of China and globalization. So we've been really fortunate to grow up and uh, develop in such a big context. For example, Edward, um, we've been friends, good friends for many years. Edward, you returned to China in 1996 or 97. Um, I'm the same as Professor Yang. 1993, I returned to China and it was difficult for returnee to establish companies in China. You know, now we've been using internet for so many years and Edward was coming to China to establish the internet infrastructure. And uh, it was um, people like Edward and uh, companies like Asia Info that helped to really establish the internet infrastructure. And we'll touch upon this again when we cover the 5G part later into the discussion. Actually, I was going to ask this question for all of you. You've had a really good career growth. And the last 20, 30 years have witnessed a huge change. Um, we were a follower when it comes to technology. We're all looking up to um, Silicon Valley. But in recent years, both China and the US media has been saying that China he is becoming a leader when it comes to technology. So what is your point of view in the arena of uh, science, technology and innovation? Is China a leader yet? What is the main driving force behind it? If we are a leader or if we are becoming a leader, then what are the segments in the next five to 10 years that China will really be leading? the technology trends. Um, who would like to start first? Right. Um, maybe you can start first, Zexiang. Um, Yaxin, you can go ahead. I want to um, look at the trends from a macro level. And then I will talk about my particular industry. We're talking about the fourth industrial revolution. We've had uh, steam and then power and information era. And now we're coming into the AI era. The first three industrial revolutions, China was uh, just a follower or was just watching it happening. And now we have the opportunity to become a leader. But of course, there are many challenges. In the information and the internet arena, there was copy to China, you know, for both technologies and business models, early um, maintenance or social or search or e-commerce. And then um, PC, Connect, internet connection and the mobile connection. And for mobile connection, um, a lot of the apps that China has offers better experience, user experience than those of uh, the US. Although this, the technology behind it, China is uh, learning from the US, but the user experience, as well as the total planning of these apps are better quality than those of the US. 
And then, for example, the cashless society, mobile payment, in this aspect, China is ahead of the U.S. And also the telecommunication infrastructure, infrastructure in China, China is better than that in the U.S. And also there are many O2O companies and applications and many internet companies here. I won't give any names. I think in general, they are all better than those in the U.S. In terms of the re, uh, basic in innovation and also like the algorithm and the 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 structure infrastructure i think the us uk and maybe canada are still the leading ones in the next five to ten years i think china it is very likely for us to become a leader in those areas and uh, we have new and en new energy and also a life science and China has an opportunity, has a chance to become a leader in all these areas. Okay, thank you very much. I also want to build on that. Right now in Shenzhen, we know there is the Great Bay Area. In the past 20 years, the Great Bay Area have developed really rapidly. Both the products, especially the development of hardware, it has been rapid. The early stage entrepreneurs, they, were, they studied and they copied at, copied a lot of the products from overseas because back in those years, both technology and knowledge were really lacking for those entrepreneurs. And the entrepreneurs saw that uh, overseas have really good products and equipment. So they got those products and uh, they try to copy those products and uh, optimize them if needed. And throughout that process, the OEM business in China and uh, offering this manufacturing and services to foreign companies and slowly established uh, China's own supply chain. And uh, we've managed to form the most complete and competitive uh, manufacturing ecosystem or supply chain system. And this is crucial because because it's really helpful for companies like uh, DJI and uh, some other returnee entrepreneurs. These people, they have the knowledge and they have received internationalized education. Whether it's people who studied in Hong Kong or people who studied overseas, these returnees, they have the knowledge and then they are exposed to global experiences. And now they can leverage China's comprehensive and competitive supply chain system. And also there are new needs and demands of the market as well as from the industries in China. We know that demand is the mother to innovation. China has had a strong domestic demand over the years. And of course, there are overseas demands as well. These demands enabled our young entrepreneurs to leverage these newly emerging demands and to come up with ideas 
that can better satisfy the demands. Some of the solutions are similar to those from abroad, and some solutions were non-existent. They are completely new solutions, and they used the supply chain system with their hard work, with their dedication, and managed to create a lot of brand new innovative products. So I can't say that we are already a leader or how much better we are than others. What I can say is that we can meet our own demands. We do not need to copycat anymore. We don't need to have to copy other countries' products anymore. And that is the current status quo. Okay, thank you for that input. Edward or Howard, what would you like to share? I'll say a few words. First of all, I completely agree with um, the two gentlemen's um, analysis of where we are today. I totally agree with you. I returned to China back in 94, and I witnessed how the industries has developed. And I totally agree with Professor Li Zexiang. For example, Shenzhen, early in the days, there were a lot of copycats. And it's like reversed engineering. When I came back, I started working as a designer or chip designer at Beiling in Shanghai. And it, back then, it was also a reversed engineering that we were doing, you know, open up the chip and then take a photograph. And, and then that was a standard process that was, about, uh, was being used. And afterwards, we started doing um, sequential design. But uh, the general manager was opposing to that idea. But I said, if it's reversed uh, design or engineering, there was no need to hire me. The, I joined this company because I wanted to do sequential engineering. It was not easy. So it started from the components model. And um, I was the first one to introduce the business three, which I believe Professor Lee knows very well. Uh, started from the most basics. And then I started teaching at Fudan University, and I was teaching engineers at night. Teaching the most basic uh, theories. And it may sound very hard to believe now. And there were many students who graduated from uh, Jiao Tong University, but they didn't know how CMOS works. So you can see the huge gap there. So the past two decades, we changed from copycat to reversed engineering, taking shortcuts, changing all the way to independent R&D, regardless of the types of products. And the next step is innovation. You know, companies like a DJI is a good example. They innovate and they are now a leader in its own industry. So there are four steps. The first one is copying, and then doing your own thing, and then real innovation. And then the last step is to lead and to shape that industry with your own technologies. And that process takes time. But, uh, we haven't been able to be to reach the fourth step in all aspects and areas, and there are only certain areas that we've managed to really lead and shape. In a few um, fields, our 
research standards have become international standards. And we become a leader in that specific segment. But that just is, that is just a dot, whether it is an integrated circuit or some other high tech. We've made some breakthroughs on those dots. Uh, when can we connect the dots into lines? When can we connect the lines into a surface? But most importantly, we need to have more dots. We need to have more segments and fields where we really um, go committed and uh, become a leader. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you very much, um, Howard. What about Edward? I believe um, recently uh, students in the U.S. Uh, may feel the pressure because I see that uh, my American friends, you know, are talking about uh, IP or copy to China. Um, I feel I have this mixed feelings when I hear those words. And uh, during the pandemic, um, we saw the tension between U.S. and China over technologies and some other um, issues. So during the pandemic, I read some um, articles or books about uh, technology innovation. We know that uh, the steaming machine um, or the core technologies they were all born in Europe and they were widely applied in the US and there were more innovation in the process of application. I also read a lot of examples and there were a lot of uh, laws that were adopted in the UK, but you know, for the US markets, these technologies were widely used. And that's why we have the largest steel plants, US steel, and they used the steam technology and managed to invent products like cars. So if we look back into the history, and then, and then we can learn from that part of the history. And in China, we have the big market and we have emerging demands. And technology is not static. Technology is evolving all the time. I mean, the reason why I spend so much time and energy on 5G is because there will be a lot of new data types the data types, you know, the types or the intensity density of data are in, unimaginable for us today. And when and then there will be more innovation into data. And in China, we have this advantage. We have all these the large amount of data. And I believe there will be a lot more innovation and new infrastructure coming from this data. I heard some people saying CPU, and they say it's going to change into DPU, data processing unit, because in China, 5G will help to generate huge amount of data. So things are not perfect at the moment. There are still things that are very upsetting um, or we feel confused about, but uh, if we look back into the history, we can learn the lessons and we should feel very confident, you know, looking into the future. I believe in the next 20, 30 years, um, as China is generating more types of data at large scale and with more innovations, um, innovations that are not just beneficial for China, it will be beneficial to the rest of the world of the world, just like uh, cars or electricity. You know, we learned and we are studying from the US and uh, these young entrepreneurs, they, are, they work hard and they will innovate and they will give back to the rest of the world. And I think we'll have a spl splendid time. And I believe that's the direction that uh, history is headed to. Professor Tian, speaking of the history of technology, I have a follow-up question. I read a lot of uh, 
mega trends after the Second World War. And basically for every mega trend, there should be the first half of the game and second half. First half is about eight to 15 years. It was more about installation of infrastructure. And when the infrastructure was ready, the second half, another eight to 10 years about application scenarios and deployment. Professor Ya Ya Qing mentioned that in PC, in mobile, mobile internet, and including artificial intelligence, China enterprises do more job in deployment because the protocols have been written by America and we do a lot of innovative deployment development. And now including 5G, there are new rounds of technological rounds. So maybe in the future, we are going to see installations, but we in China, well, we are not good at it. Do you think it is a challenge? What is your perspective? I think in the word 5G, there are a lot of contents. And in the core, there is a great dream, connecting people, connecting things. Every piece of device, and even every grass, every tree, every animal will be connected. And this kind of connection in China has received continuous investment and is happening. And you ask a great question. This is physical connection. And on top of it, the data structure is very complicated. When we have 5G, is it possible to have something totally new and integrated like OS challenge or opportunity. After war, we never encountered such a scenario and our capability in infrastructure was just average. But with 5G connection, there will emerge a lot of demands and some demands are very destructive very elementary, like public cloud. Ya Qing spent a lot of time discussing with me regarding the changes brought by public cloud, like the industrial cloud, the connection between cloud and internet. And I believe demands like these can be satisfied. The reasons behind that as being explained, we had experience during the past three decades We've tried a lot of errors and why I think internet is important. In the past four decades, a lot of uh, very uh, important innovation had some connection with the Bell Lab, like the wireless telecommunication, all came from that lab. And it's just like at and there is a distance here. They had a lot of research using net or connectivity, but they adjusted on top of that. So they got the demands from the internet and then they created the prototype and then had the prototype tested in the net, in the internet. And China will have the biggest 5G network and the Bell Lab, in today's environment will be a lot of the new enterprises. So the innovation cycle is going to be shortened and the cost will be lowered. I like to add on top of Edward's remarks. First of all, China's market, historically speaking, was an emerging market. The middle and upper level of demand is going to be 10 times bigger than that in the Japan time. And after three decades or four decades, especially the most recent two decades, we had a lot of communication we have a lot of accumulation 
and the iterations B of supply chain, well, I have done some comparison. I would say the speed versus Silicon Valley outspeed is going to be five or 10 times more efficient, but the cost is one fifth or one tenth of that in Silicon Valley and the proximity. I mean, you sit in the office writing codes, coming up with your ideas, and then factories produce prototypes of your ideas. And after that, we have massive production. It takes only about half an hour. So in today's environment, China's innovation speed is much quicker than any other region or country in the world. Much, much quicker. So our uh, students in America, in Colombia, you can see there is such a big opportunity. There is such a big market demand leveraging the most complete supply chain ecosystem, leveraging the fastest iteration cycling system or ecosystem, right? As long as you have good ideas, so today you have good ideas, even if like half an hour ago, there emerged a good idea. And after 30 minutes, every person in every corner of the world got to know that. So it's all about the speed of iteration and efficiency and whether the market is big enough. And today's China is well equipped with very advantageous circumstances. So as long as we can come up with good ideas, we'd better be quick to take actions. You have very quick deployment. It is the right timing, the right era for quick deployment. I like to share with you my thoughts. I totally agree with other panelists' comments. Speaking of innovation, the question was about the drive. First of all, there is a huge market economy of scale. And second, there is a need for innovation. I often say innovation is an outcome of being forced to do so. If you can quickly deploy an American uh, product in China and if you can very quickly copy that product, well, this is one way. But after two decades, we find that that is not enough because we have so many companies copying other companies and these companies have competition among themselves. So innovation has become a core competence. We need to be better than others. We need to have our strength, technological innovation in the market. It has become a core competence. Next is economy of scale. We know there's difference between innovation and we know invention is from zero to one, but innovation is from one to M. So that's the difference between invention and innovation. So in America, we see a lot of things become really big. So it's about the innovation, the market size. Edward said really well that we are now in a new era with data explosion. And we call it digital 3.0. So in this physical world, the vehicles, traffic lights, the city, factories, machines, uh, the grid, everything is connected. And our bodies, our life, our brain, our DNA, RNA, genomics are getting digitized or our organs are getting digitized. And compared with the past, this round of digitization is totally different. So first of all, it is super 
huge, super mega. Like for autonomous driving every day, it generates three TB size data. So, and also every sequence for a person is also three TB. So it's super big. And not to mention the proteins structure. So this is data explosion. Growth is exponential. And in the past, digitization was for people to watch like video, images, pictures, etc. But now it is for machine, machine to machine. Over 90% is not for people, but for machine to machine. And third point is very exciting, but also it's a horrible thing, maybe. Machines make decisions for people, like autonomous driving, the drone, machines help you sell products, machines advocate or promote products to you, and there's machine medical or clinical diagnosis. So in the future, more decisions are going to be made by machines. And our six decade old infrastructure is changing now. Like the Moore's law has reached the ceiling, the computing structure has reached the ceiling. And we'll talk about the transformation from CPU to DPU. Exactly, it's all about the processing of data, the communication, etc. In the past, computer is like, centralized and then decentralization happened and then with cloud it became centralized again and now we need a new telecom structure a new computing theory to cover a wider range a wider dimension so these are all drives for innovation do we need more chips today's chips structures are different the AI chips, GPU, we need some AI specific chips. We need new OS, new platform, new telecommunication types. So many things need to be innovated. So this is a very exciting age. Maybe these things are also blank in America. I like to share my thoughts too. Well, there are three key points. First of all, a mature infrastructure. The infrastructure, infrastructure has become mature. And second is China's size is huge. And because of these two points, tremendous size of data has been generated. There has been a tagline today about the internet. Internet is about putting new wine in an old bottle, which means give you new concepts, very refreshing names like digital twin technology. A digital twin technology from design perspective in the very early days, like in the past few decades, we needed to build a model in the computer, uh, simulate the model in the computer, and then come to the production. And now today's digital trains is about leveraging that ideas to other areas because you have 5G, you have all types of data you can, and also because our algorithm capability is much better, so we can do a digital dream in this digital world, which means I had a twin in my computer based on big data, and there is a closed loop. And this closed loop eventually will become highly efficient. Very fast iteration has been mentioned by Professor Lee. It will happen. Because of this digital twin technology, things will happen. 
and it will generate more data. Scale will become bigger with more data. And everything will be faster. Efficiency will be better. So this is a process. The process will be faster. So in this digital revolution, in this new era, I believe it will become more and more obvious. It's an apparent progress. Exactly. I totally agree. We are in this ever-changing era of technological innovation. And when we were young, computer to us was about processor, a uh, processor, and storage panel, and then a big data neural system. New ideas come up, so we have to have a disrupt disruptive structure, and we need new memory technologies to deal with it. And I am so excited. Human beings are now in a very fast changing era, and for investment perspective, AI, autonomous driving, a semiconductor, and industrial automation, robotics, and 5G are very heated topics. And when I listen to the introduction of mobiles, it seems that the four of you have your specialty in the above mentioned area. So now I would like to give you, each of you five minutes and I am going to ask you some questions regarding or concerning your own discipline so that we can have some more uh, in-depth discussion. So my first question goes to Professor Chen Yaqing. You know, AI is a heated topic back in 2016, March 2016, AlphaGo stimulated people's passion. And in 2018, it was super popular. So it was a very heated topic and and i was involved in the investment over 20 and 30 ai companies but all of a sudden one year later people said that winter had come because the application or the deployment had a big gap compared with our expectation so for you do you think it is truly a winter for AI right now? And what is the development trend in the next five years for AI? I think it's a golden era for the development of AI. After 50 or 60 years of development, after all these ups and downs, eventually five years ago, AI started to have massive application and now the technology is about uh, in-depth learning just now we talk about the explosion of data the algorithms capability uh, has been greatly enhanced so from cn to rn to trans learning further gp trend model etc big leap in terms of the development so it's all about big data and algorithm and in the future, well, or is today the winter? I can give you one example. Today's AI looks so much like the internet in the 90, 98 or 1999. Maybe in 2001, we saw the internet bubbles and maybe some companies' uh, valuation was too high. There were bubbles back then. But looking back from now, the internet industry and good companies survived very well and they developed very quickly. AI, in order to be deployed in every industry, I believe every industry will leverage big data and big data will change their models, earth-shaking change 
And I believe in each segment will be, there will be trillion dollar level enterprise. So I believe there's no bubble. The development has just started. But if you ask me which companies have a too, high, too high valuation, well, I don't know. It is your expertise. Maybe you have invested in too many companies because you have too much money. That may lead to uh, a very high valuation. But in terms of uh, R&D, for in-depth learning, there are some defaults like the black box. Like uh, the cost and the effect and the transparency issues of the black box, but I believe gradually uh, more models and knowledge can be included and solve that problem. But I think uh, right now it's a prime time and, uh, and it will be so for the next five years. That's very interesting, your comments. We have observed a lot of interesting applications of AI. And, uh, but you mentioned about the GTP3 transfer one and this uh, underlying models. These are from the US research institutes. But uh, what about China's uh, AI? You no know, other than application. Uh, and, uh, now there is a Tsinghua University AI Industry Research Institute. What role is that institute going to play? Now for the algorithm and also these uh, bases of the theories, um, of course, they're all from the Western world. China has been developing very rapidly and we've seen a lot of uh, new algorithms um, and uh, papers published uh, by a lot of universities and industries, but uh, we are lacking foundational technology. We're still lacking that. So if we have the time and if we have the patience and uh, really embrace these new applications, and uh, if these top academia professors can really go deep into these uh, issues, and I believe we will have our own foundational technology and application as well. Um, Zexiang, and we're all working on autonomous driving, which is uh, maybe the most difficult application in the AI area, I keep saying autonomous driving for the five to 10 years would be the most challenging and complicated area, but it is solvable. And we'll talk about that uh, in a minute, but overall, I'm very optimistic. Um, yes, of course, there is challenges. And if we just want to um, publish papers and uh, look at short term, then we will never have the foundational technologies in the future. That's why you know, we established uh, this uh, um, AI um, industry park. And uh, because just having these papers and is, is not the most important, we, re we really want to go in deep into the research. And also, I want to talk about the talents. Um, over the years, companies like uh, Microsoft or Baidu were still lacking the top um, architect um, and CTO. So the Tsinghua Air, or uh, it's abbreviated as Air, and we would like to um, really uh, cultivate more talents so that we could have our own foundational technologies and to further apply these technologies in industries and have some startup businesses. So you mentioned uh, autonomous driving. So just to follow up on that. You know, for Tesla, 
there is the generation 2.5 or generation 3. And it is uh, still far away from real complete uh, autonomous driving. And there is another company that's Waymo and also uh, Baidu. You know, they're all working on the fully and complete complete autonomous driving. And, and also the Changsha um, Smart Driving Research Institute and working on the long haul transportation trucks. So which model do you think will succeed in the next few years? That's a very good question, but it's a very broad one. So I will try to answer that uh, within two minutes. There is a bit of a background. You know, SCE has you know, five levels of automation. For level four and five, it's driverless. It's complete driverless driving. And there are different types of vehicles. It could be passenger car. It could be vehicles used for the tourist sites or for mines or for transportation. Let's just focus on the driverless passenger car, which is the most difficult. And there are two levels here. First is a single vehicle. How can we achieve level four, level five? Um, Tesla or Mobile M, what they have is slowly evolving from L2, 3, 4. You know, having all these cars first and then generating the data, improving the algorithm, and then finally reaching level four and five. Um, and most of the sensors used are more visual. The other model is uh, Waymo in the US, Google, and in China is Baidu. So these companies, they achieve to level four or five directly. You know, when they design, they design from the perspective of driverless. And I personally believe more in the latter because if it is just a visual or progressive, although having good number of data is good, but you do not have the intelligence. More data doesn't mean intelligence. So, so you, you need to have data from different dimensions to make it more intelligent. So whether it's a vehicle to vehicle or V V two X, and I think the uh, the the connectivity and uh, vehicle and a road working together is very important. You know, traffic congestion or a accident, um, or you cannot see the road lamps on a snowy day. Um, if you are in a, in a junction on the roads and if there are sensors there that can send the signal into the cars, which means the car and the road interact with each other, this is a totally new dimension. There's a functional safety and V2X is a new dimension. Why do we want to have driverless cars? Most important is for safety. We know that 90% uh, of the accidents are because of uh, the drivers. And uh, if it's driverless, the rate of accidents will drop. So that's why I say safety. And uh, there will be a lot less um, safety accidents in the future when cars are driverless. You no know, machine making the decisions means that there will be so many sensors and there will be so much data. And that's what makes machine um, more smart than us. So 
I think uh, V2X and also multiple sensors, these are uh, all, all make it possible that a machine can make better decisions than human beings. And of course, the more data, the better. V2X, I believe, is uh, um, where we can overtake US because for V2X, you need to have the more city level planning. And because it's so difficult to make changes to the city and roads in the US, it will be easier in China, cities like Changsha, Beijing, Guangzhou, and also Shenzhen, which I just uh, returned from. And they have already done a lot of things in this area and they're really, really pushing forward. And our city authorities are all very ambitious and they're very willing to use their own cities as a testing field for autonomous driving. So to answer your question first, is multiple sensors. And uh, second, you need to have V2X and that's where China can really get ahead, set up um, than the US. Next question I want to ask uh, Howard. Um, semiconductor has really draw a lot of attention last year. Um, there is uh, an investment of 140 billion RMB, um, and this, that's a huge investment increase. And more than 200 companies were listed on Starboard. And uh, there are 33 of them are semiconductor companies. And your company is also is a semiconductor company with really high market cap. Why all of a sudden semiconductor industry comes into such a rapid um, development uh, period of time. When I returned to China, I started, uh, um, I entered into the semiconductor industry because I didn't know anything else well enough. Over 10 years ago, semiconductor was not so hot. Many young people were saying it's too difficult and were staying away from it. And from the investor's perspective, the return is not high enough. And they're all saying that the US was going to give up a semiconductor. They've moved the manufacturing facilities into Asia, um, places like uh, Taiwan and uh, South Korea. So for a while, um, in Silicon Valley, there was minimum investment in semiconductors. And Jiming in the early years didn't invest in semiconductors either. But uh, all of a sudden, in the recent couple of years, it seems that uh, semiconductor industry has become really hot, almost boiling hot. A few factors, I think, are the driving force. First is uh, the newly emerging demands in the market like the industries that our panelists are in, including AI and uh, 5G, also robotics and drones. These types of applications and also autonomous driving, of course, these types of applications will demand completely new chips which creates a new market, basically. In the past years, it was driven more by computers and then by mobile phones. And now um, multiple applications are demanding more chips and more semiconductors. So there is such demand for semiconductors in the market. So semiconductors um, or computers um, they are all a digital world. Um, you can imagine um, it goes up like a step, whether it is uh, storage or computing. Once you have the chip,
you know, you have, it, it's not like you have the application today and then application tomorrow. The capability of the hardware stays the same once you manufactured it. You know, the speed of it and capacity of it is already set. It's not going to change. But what are our needs? And our needs are continuously increasing in a linear way and continuous way. So at a certain point, you will see it's over capacity, but at another point, it's under capacity. Like right now, um, our capacity is, uh, um, is not enough. So once the semiconductors are produced, the capacity is set. When you have new demands and needs, you need to have a, a new chip in order to satisfy those new needs. So now there is the mar need in the market, but uh, supply is not enough. It's an undersupplied market. And of course, there is also a political reason. You know, we have to rely on ourselves uh, for semiconductors, and so is uh, uh, Europe, because Europe is running out of uh, semiconductors as well, and it's been replaced by US and Asia. Europe had really strong semiconductors like Eva and uh, Philips and uh, Siemens and some SME. Many of them had uh, uh, semiconductors. But now we realize that our semiconductors are all gone. And that's why Europe is going to pick this up again. And for China, due to multiple reasons, we have to have our own semiconductors. So there is the market reason, and there's also the political reason. And that's why we're seeing semiconductor becoming so hot. You know, I was joking. I've been waiting for 20 years, finally, in China. No, people didn't know what semiconductors were or what chips are, but now everybody is talking about chips. Uh, I was giving a lecture in Shanghai Library, um, and I was talk I was going to talk about uh, using AI to analyze the China's uh, paintings, but uh, the organizer asked me to talk about semiconductors. And, and chips, you know, so I had to talk about chips in, in my lecture. That shows people who want to talk about uh, the traditional Chinese paintings, they want to know what's going on with the semiconductors as well. So you see that uh, it's uh, not just restricted to the industry who's interested, and the whole of China and people are all interested in knowing more about chips. And of course, um, there is an important investment going into this industry. So Howard, just uh, one more question. So you can just answer yes or no. And then China's self-sufficiency rate of chips is uh, less than 30%. Uh, and China say that uh, um, the self-sufficiency rate needs to reach to 70 to 80% in years to come. I think that's a good and ambitious goal, but I think it's going to be very challenging to bring that up to that level. Thank you very much, Howard. Uh, next question I would like to ask uh, Zexia, Professor Zexiang. And uh, you've helped to incubate a lot of robotics companies like uh, DJI and Google and Songshanghu. So in terms of robotics, whether it's uh, in an in, in industrial um, sector um, and in Ch and, and the China market, uh, how are we comparing with other giants like uh, um, Europe or Japan? In terms of the key parts and components of robotics, like uh, the sensors um, or the drive um, components, China, 
is now playing catch up. In certain areas, the catching up process is very quick. And we can satisfy our demands, basically, because the terminal products we see, like the drones, like the floor cleaning machines, all kinds of intelligent products. The localization rate of core parts and components has become higher and higher. It showcases our rapid development of basic industry. But whether it is robotics or AI or 5G or even chips, these are very important tools, important tools. In each field, they have their own potential. But for these tools, from another perspective, the tools are like a hammer. If you use a hammer to punch a snail, it's going to take a much longer time. Is it the most efficient way? Especially for experts, young entrepreneurs, they have their own understanding. And my, my observation is entrepreneurs, young engineers, for them, they need to learn how to spot problems, how to identify issues with some discipline values and we need a holistic methodology to assess whether this topic has value and currently the solutions we have they have pain points which are whether technology is applicable whether laws or regulations can permit these new technological solutions, can allow these technological solutions to be implemented. That's why we need a new generation of entrepreneurs, new generation of engineers to start from the issues and then leverage different technologies, different tools to have very fast iteration, to have fast deployment. And I have to leave very soon, so I will put it simple regarding the progresses we have. But recently in Shenzhen, we are about to establish a new uh, science and technological innovation campus. It's about uh, fostering a new generation of entrepreneurs, starting from issues first, starting from the pain points for uh, different disciplines, different industries, for consumers. I mean, the areas that have big commercial values and then integrate with new technologies, existing technologies, manufacturing technologies. So that we can very quickly deploy these solutions or ideas. I believe if we have plenty of these kinds of talents or young people, definitely we will see a new era with technological innovation and our core part and component technologies, some fundamental technologies can move ahead very quickly. Uh, sorry that I have to leave.
because I have other matters to deal with. So I have to leave early. Thank you, moderator. Uh, thank you, the other three panelists. Thank you, thank you, Professor Li Zexiang. So my next question is for Edward. You are a veteran in telecommunication industry, and we know 5G is so hot right now. And you mentioned that 5G is different from other telecommunication technologies. I heard you mention that 5G was not for human being. What do you mean? 5G is built for whom? Well, 5G has become a very big topic. And we all know when a thing becomes super popular, it's possible that we don't see through, we uh, don't observe the challenges. I do believe that the 5G is not for people. 5G is for things, connecting things, everything. But it is very difficult to have all the things connected. And in our industry, they say there are three differences. One is today, like we have EMMTC. It's about better efficiency with the mobile broadband. Second is machine to machine. But so far, uh, the standards haven't come out, but the original plan was last year, but because of the pandemic, the target is quarter three this year. And number three, as we mentioned by Yaqi, we need URMMC for uh, V2X. For technology and common understanding in this world, we still need some time. And 5G takes a different path. One is internationalization like Huawei, uh, ZTE, Nokia. And it is very difficult to have this kind of protocol or standards because we have GSMA in Europe, we have American standards, we have CDMA, and we have TD, TDSCMA in China. And eventually, finally, with 5G, we need a universal protocol. But there is a trend. It is called Open 5G. So it's a software defined open radio access network. There are different paths, just like the WiMAX versus 3G by Intel. So technological transformation is in a very typical, it's in a very critical time and very exciting because it will bring us with a lot of uh, opportunities and the change is fundamental. It's even more fundamental than internet because internet is about the connection of people and things. It's about the creation of different scenarios. And with the change in infrastructure, what is the opportunity for our country? First of all, investment in 5G. Even in phase one, it requires a big size of capital. For example, the base stations density needs to be increased by three to five times. If we want to have an independent network, taking China Mobile, for example, this year, it will establish 1.5 million stations throughout China. So for such a tremendous size of investment, China is going to build the largest 5G network in the world. And on top of it, I believe there will be plenty of opportunities. 5G is closely connected with AI. You know, Ya Qing knows AI very well. If AI is going to be our brain, 5G is like our neural system. So we are building massively this neural system now, no matter how long it takes, no matter what kind of technological challenges we are facing, but with such strong mind from the country and great attention from the people and the new infrastructure pace, I believe in the next five years, China will become or will have the biggest 5G network in the world. As we mentioned by Professor, where is the application scenario for 5G, whether we have chicken 
first or at first? In the history, we have a lot of this kind of questions asked. It's about how entrepreneurs can leverage 5G. Just like 4G, people believed that there wasn't going to be plenty of deployment for 5G, but with the short video coming out, 4G was not sufficient. So whether it should be open or whether I should choose a path like a software. Well, this debate will become more and more interesting. And I believe there will be a lot of opportunities coming out of it. So, of course, we need to pay attention to 5G. And you ask, you know, Huawei has done its job and the big telecommunication carriers have done their job. What can we do? But there are a lot of pending issues like the security of 5G. When every piece of industrial machine is connected, when every car is connected, under the 5G system, we need the software to provide a lot of de definition. So without security, there is no 5G. So for questions like this, we need entrepreneurship and innovation. If 5G is going to uh, open the integration of internet and cloud requires a much stronger, stronger infrastructure and the current infrastructure will have adjustment because the level is different. We have open sourced IT uh, mission critical network, the QS of network and different level of a quality service. In 5G environment, all the above mentioned aspects need to get enhanced. So the next generation enterprises and the next generation uh, operational systems will be given higher requirements. So 5G now is very popular. It's a very popular topic among or in the media. And I believe very soon we will see real demands coming out of it, opportunities and challenges, the security of 5G network, how can we have peripheral cloud and network, making it open and stable and reliable at the same time. So the curtain is just about to be opened and the main battlefield is in China. Thank you, thank you, Professor Tian Guo very insightful sharing. So the time is almost up. It's like that I has attended a very insightful uh, class. So for the three of you, if you are investors, and today online we have a lot of uh, business school students. So if you want to invest in a public or yet to be public, yet to be listed companies. So what kind of companies will you invest in? So um, Professor Tian first. I disagree with you. I have done some investment recently and I believe that institutions like us haven't done a good job in guiding the young people. So in the future, we need to focus on the real fundamental things instead of only focusing on the very apparent phenomenon. And we are definitely going to see a lot of uh, obstacles. We know capital aims at short term, but what we need is long-term persistence. Think about internet today from TCP IP network. Well, TCP IP has been in existence for two decades. It was the seed planted by the upnet developers. So never get, uh, never miss what's really important. We need to learn the managerial methods, which cannot be learned from uh, business schools, but from real practice in real companies. Totally agree. And Yati and Howard, any, different opinions or comments from you two? Uh, 
I totally agree with that word, Tian, because we are from the industry and we have some invested portfolio projects. But for people in high tech industry, we do need long term in depth devotion or commitment. Well, China's reform and opening up in the past 10 years or 20 years. Well, in the first 10 to 20 years, there was a lot of a quick money to make. So there was a habit for the society or for investment community. People wanted to make quick money, even for those IPO or public listed companies or high debt companies, they aim at short term. This is not good for China's technological development. Technological development, especially high tech, needs long-term arduous work in order to get something done, in order to do things well. But after all, they are institutions, investors. So we need to answer the question that I chose the three companies for manufacturing perspective, of course, we need to focus on SMIC. China's semiconductor giant leader. But of course, I talk about long-term. It is a publicly listed companies and uh, we pay great attention to this uh, leading player. But for non-public companies, maybe you don't know them, there is a company, a very good company, who does a PV, a professor from Berkeley, called Portion. It's a very good technology of photoelectricity. And the other one is called Bolio, as it, it is about wireless connectivity technology, very good one. So here I give you three companies' names. Okay, what well, about you? Giving us some closing remarks. I cannot give you uh, three companies. First of all, I truly don't know. The second, I am sitting in the board in many publicly listed companies. So in such a public scenario, I cannot really give you names. But personally, I think there are three areas in terms of investment. One is in the banks. The second is about people's necessities for living. And the third is investment for the future. And there are some big trends. For the fourth industrial revolution, there will be big trends. And the next thing is people will really master technologies. And the third is when you do an investment, you need to truly understand that industry. So that's it from my side. Edward talked about 5G. We are doing something really big. We are building future infrastructure. Every time either it's mobile network, you know. For 3G, there was different ways. When there was 4G, when there was airport construction, highway construction, there was always different ways. But with infrastructure, application will come. When the road is wide enough, cars will definitely come to run. When the broadband is wide enough, definitely there will be users. So there will definitely be deployment. No matter how many airports you have, it will never be enough. China is developing very quickly and huge potential, great momentum because we have infrastructure, telecommunication, transportation, payment, so many uh, smart mobile phones, and we have GPS location, 
when you have these things, sometimes you don't even feel the existence of these things, but rapid and ex explosive development will come eventually. Edward's comment was so accurate. 5G, for the first time, integrate different networks. In the past, all were isolated, but now with open source technology, with chips, with peripheral intelligence, it can satisfy different applications. In the past, the telecommunication and internet technologies were separated. They do not talk to each other, the protocols or technologies. But now is the first time to connect uh, the two. So, 6G is, has already started, and for 6G, it's going to be even a larger scale of integration. For 5G, people have concerns around efficiency and energy consumption, etc. But I believe these issues will all be resolved. Deployment only started last year, and for sure we'll have these issues for the first three years. Um, but uh, it's a very important field where China is ahead of the rest of the world. Thank you very much, uh, our panelists, uh, for your input. And that is why we'd like to have such events, because we hope that uh, all the MBA students um, or other students, and uh, we would encourage you to really go deep and go into the industries and make our contribution to the advancement of our technology. Thank you very much, our panelists, for your sharing. Thank you all the panelists for your insightful discussion on China's technology industry. And thank you audience around the world for your time. On April the 8th at 8 p.m. Eastern time and April the 9th, 8 a.m. Beijing time, we will live stream the fifth session, Wu Forum with Lulu Wang and Wan Li Martello. Live from Columbia Business School in New York City, good morning and good night.